Um, hello, uh, good morning everyone. So I'm going to give some lectures about topological recursion. Uh, well, first, what is topological recursion? I like to illustrate it by this picture. And uh, well, this is just a picture. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's, uh, we would like to find really a, a geometric understanding of, of that picture. But so topological recursion is, a, is just a way to compute certain quantities and that are useful in practice, uh, but it's still uh, something in progress and there are still lots of things to understand. Uh, and what is really truly amazing is how uh, is that it works, is that it works very often in many situations. So uh, I will, f so this is uh, my plan. I will start by a very general introduction uh, with some example, and then I will give the definitions of what I call spectral curves, topological recursion. Uh, I will start to give the first few properties and uh, explain how to do computations and relate it to uh, the moduli spaces. Uh, and mention that there is a recent approach by Konsevich and Seubelman, which is slightly different. And the link between the two approaches, uh, I think, is not totally well understood. Uh, and also, uh, then the third part will be about studying deformations. And that's really where you have integrable systems. And then I will uh, give some applications. Uh, some of them are conjectures, like the applications to knot theory. Uh, and uh, so this will be uh, depending on how much time we have. Uh, so, my, so first, what are we talking about? Topological recursion seems to have a lot to do with mirror symmetry. And mirror symmetry uh, has two sides. One side is uh, what is often called the A model, and which is in fact enumerative geometry. And in that, uh, on that side, the goal is, to, uh, is that we have a certain space, a moduli space, so I'm very general at this moment. We have a certain moduli space, let me call that MGN, uh, that depends on some parameters. Uh, let me call them Z1, Zn, whatever they are for the moment. They are just moduli, uh, which is a space of uh, typically Riemann surfaces with n boundaries of genus G and boundaries Z1, Z2, up to Zn. Uh, so it's a set of surfaces decorated, uh, so with, of genus G with, boundary, uh, with n boundaries, uh, decorated with some moduli. Uh, there can be more moduli that I didn't write. Um, well, whatever it is. And the idea is that we would like to compute the volume of that space. So the question which we would like to answer is, so let me call that WGN of Z1, Zn, would be the volume of that space. So this means that we need to have defined a kind of uh, form that we can integrate, a volume form that we can integrate. It can be a symplectic form, it can be a measure, it can be whatever you want. Uh, but we want to compute the size of that space, and it will be a function of Z1, Zn. I missed it maybe something. Is Mgn is compact? Or no, something? no. For the moment, it's a totally abstract thing. It's no, it does not need to be compact or whatever. It's just a space. Uh, it's just a very general introduction of the, the spirit of what we want to do. We have a certain space, and we want to integrate a form over that space, and we assume that somehow uh, this makes sense. Case by case, we will have something precise, either compact or with some function that decreases at infinity or whatever, uh, or, or sometimes it will be a discrete space, for instance, the space of triangulated surfaces, 
uh, it's a discrete space, uh, so the, the sum is in fact a finite sum, for instance, or something like that. And very you can have gra grading to make it a formal series or whatever. Uh, so it's just we want to compute those volumes. And, uh, and the idea of topological recursion is imagine that we have cer a certain structure. Imagine that we have a certain structure such that you can compute them by recursion. So uh, imagine that uh, knowing knowing only the W01, so which is the disk. So by the way, I will call this the amplitudes. It will just be a name for the moment. Uh, so if you know the disk amplitude and the cylinder, so if you know the disk and the cylinder, Imagine that you have a recursive procedure that allows to compute all the others and that corresponds somehow to that picture. So uh, then it's possible to compute WGN by recursion on on this number, which is 2g minus 2 plus n, which is the Euler characteristic, somehow. So imagine that you are able to compute uh, those volumes by recursion on the Euler characteristic. I will give a precise example yeah. later. Sorry. 2g minus 2 minus n, it's a recursive surface. OK. Yeah. So the, 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 top the Euler characteristic of, of the objects that are inside the space. And the, the eyes are uh, complex numbers, not uh, not. Numbers. For the moment, they are whatever you want. Mm. If, if there are cycles, there's no topological recursion. Sorry? Now, for example, in ground Newton theory, you can uh, see the model space, of course, which intersects some cycles, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So there's no for, for the moment, it, I'm not saying what they are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, you're saying that volume is kind of all a characteristic? If you want. Yeah, according to the definition. Yeah. No, no, no. No, W is no. no, no, no. But I, I didn't say what is the measure that you integrate or whatever. So it's it's something very abstract. It's just, <laughs> it's just some notation. It's just I just want to give the spirit. Uh, but later I will give a very precise example where you will see what happens. Uh, so now we have the B model side, which has to do with complex uh, with complex structures complex curve, well, let me call, call it complex curves, and you have something that seems to be totally unrelated to that. <coughs> it's, it seems to be totally unrelated to that, so to give, me, uh, to give an example, so imagine that you have a, a certain uh, algebraic curve, given by its equation p of x, y equals 0. Mm. So curves are uh, always embedded in surface, yeah. Excuse me? Your curves are always embedded in surface, or not? For the moment, it's just uh, an e a polynomial equation p of x, y equals 0. So I mean, I'm in fact considering an, uh, an immersion of, uh, of, uh, of a co Riemann surface into C cross C, for instance. So it defines uh, an immersion of a Riemann surface in C cross C. This will be just uh, a simple example of what I'm going to call later a spectral curve. So basically we have, so if I you plot, so you have something like that. Infinity is not included. For the moment it doesn't matter for what I'm going to say. <coughs> so, uh, you have an object which is a complex, which is uh, something with a complex structure, which is two dimensional, uh, which is, um, and on that curve, uh, you have a one form, uh, which is just y dx. Yeah. 
again, it does not really matter. For instance, here I plotted there is another point. Here. Yeah. Can it have any importance like x square equal to zero? Yeah. Yes, it can. And what is one form on this? Sorry? Ah, ah so you can get lapsus to be sub schemes, could have any importance. Yeah, well. it can be well. In fact, it's not the way I'm going to define it later, but it just uh, let me just to, to fix the idea for the introduction uh, of what we have. So on that side, we have some object with a complex structure. And uh, we have forms on it. We have a one form, which is YDX. Let me call it omega zero one. It's a one form. So le that Riemann surface, let's call it sigma, OK? And sigma is uh, immersed uh, by, so uh, each point of sigma has an x. Uh, and so each point here, x, y, uh, has an x projection and a y projection. And, uh, and, and there is a one form y dx that lives on the curve. It's a one form. Uh, it's usual to choose also a two form uh, on, so this is a one form on sigma, on sigma cross sigma, and we shall take it symmetric. And it will be, a, in fact, a tensor product. Uh, let's call it omega zero two. I'm not going to say much more about that for the moment, but it's a symmetric uh, one form on uh, sigma cross sigma. Uh, sorry, a symmetric two form on sigma cross sigma. I will say more about that later. And uh, then we define. Yeah, and also the, the 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 it has pole in the diagonal. Sorry. I will say that later. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying what it is for the moment. I'm just saying you have some meromorphic forms. Define, uh, yes, meromorphic forms. Uh, defined by recursion on again 2g minus 2 plus n, some n forms, some meromorphic on sigma to the power n. The assumption of meromorphic is on two form or only only on two? Form? No. Uh, this one is uh, obviously meromorphic also because y and x are meromorphic. So all of them are meromorphic. And typically by computing residues. So I will write all the precise definitions later. But for the moment, what I just want to say is that on one side, you have an enumerative geometry problem. On the other side, you have a complex curve. Those two problems seem totally unrelated. And uh, what we want to see is if, for instance, for a given type of space of enumerative geometry problem, is there a certain complex curve for which that computation would give exactly the same quantities as here, or vice versa, Given a complex curve, is there a moduli space such that those uh, quantities that we are computing here, so uh, defined by recursion, so we call them omega gn, uh, that, are that will be some residue of something. I'm not going to write what it is. Uh, <coughs> so. Are those forms somehow related to those amplitudes? And surprisingly, uh, the answer in many, many different types of problems, the answer is yes. And uh, the idea is that uh, on this side, the computation is quite easy. You just have to compute residues. You can put that on uh, a software, and that computes it automatically for you. You, have, you just have to press the button and it computes. Uh, so it's quite easy. And it gives the answer to the other side. And it's very surprising. Uh, so what I will show you in this lecture is, uh, what I will show you in this lecture is, 
is that given uh, what I will call a spectral curve, so which is somehow a complex curve with some extra structure, this embedding into C cross C and some extra little bit extra structure. Uh, so let's call it S. Uh, we shall build an uh, moduli space MGN and a cohomology form, a tautological form that I will call lambda of S uh, such that the omega GN are indeed uh, some integral over EMGN of this lambda of S times uh, some, uh, let me call that psi z1 uh, psi hat of zn that are also some cohomology classes. Psi hat of z uh, that are also some cohomology classes and they are typically related to uh, Chern classes of line bundles. So we shall build them explicitly. <coughs> line bundles on what? On the spectral curve or the oh. Riemann surface? No, uh, line bundles on the moduli space. So Z are, uh, Z are points of the spectral curve. So it's just to give a very general idea of what we want to do. We want to relate two things that seem totally unrelated. A problem of enumerative geometry and the problem of computing uh, some forms uh, on, uh, on a curve. And parameters match tautologically. Z corresponds to Z or there will be some mirror transform? There could be some mirror transformation. Well, okay, Le let's, let me do an example. So let me do an example, so which will be my one, two example. Mirzarani's recursion. For the moment, I did not give any definition. I just tried to give a kind of general idea of what we want to do. So now, let me consider <coughs> MGN of L1, LN is the moduli space of, uh, of um, hyperbolic, uh, so of uh, surfaces uh, well okay let me call that SGN and uh, Omega where SGN is a surface of genus G orientable with N boundaries Oh, this way, n will be always positive in the vectors. Sorry? n will be always positive. Or uh, here it can be zero. In topology percussion as well, yeah. Sorry? In topology percussion is also getting. Yeah, okay, there will be some. Uh, okay. And uh, omega is a hyperbolic metric. So this is the space of hyperbolic metrics. Uh, on SGN such that, so hyperbolic means uh, curvature the curvature is constant and equals to minus one and such that uh, the boundaries <coughs> are geodesic of lengths L1, 
ln. And you modulo isomorphisms, which are in fact isometries. <coughs> <coughs> okay, this is some very well studied space. And for instance, if you take uh, an in uh, in one uh, in M13, uh, you will have something like that. Surfaces like that with three boundaries, L1, L2, L3. <coughs> and it's well known that there is, there is a space of coordinate, uh, a set of coordinate Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. Uh, that are defined as follows. It's possible, so every such surface can be cut by geodesics, by closed geodesics. So these are closed geodesics. Uh, in fact, you can check that there are always 3G minus 3 plus N such closed geodesics uh, that cut the surface into pairs of points. So here you have three pairs of points. This way of cutting, of finding geodesics that cut the surface into pairs of points is not unique. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand. What do you mean by two pairs? By what? No, I didn't understand the word. Uh, points. Pair of points, it's trousers. It's sphere minus three disks. So somehow you have one trouser, one trouser, Okay, if you glue them together, you can reconstruct such a surface. Uh, if you glue them uh, along their geodesic boundaries, you can glue them only provided that they have the same, uh, that the boundaries have the same geodesic lengths. So the coordinates that you will use are the lengths of those geodesics, L1, L2, L3, for instance, here. Uh, but that's not sufficient because a pair of points has uh, there, there are some special points on the boundary. There are some special points on the boundary. And when you glue together, uh, you don't have to put the points at the same place. You can rotate by an angle. Yes, you, you can rotate by an angle. And in fact, so if you record all the gluing angles, OK, so the, so the fenchel nielsen coordinates are the uh, the all the all the geodesic lengths uh, and the gluing angles uh, for i equals one to three three g minus three plus n. <coughs> so in the what? They are coordinates of that space. So yeah. meaning that for every such gluing, uh, so if you fix the lengths of all those geodesics and some gluing angles you find an element of that space, <laughs> and vice versa, every element of that space uh, is uh, locally uniquely, uh, can be locally uniquely uh, uh, recovered by that. And th the reason is that if you fix three geodesic lengths, there is a unique pair of points uh, hyperbolic with those uh, three geodesic lengths. So these are local coordinates. They are not global coordinates because uh, there are different ways of cutting the surface. So for instance, the same surface, or, or just let me give you a, a very simple example. This surface, so in M04, you can take this cutting or you can take that one. You get two different lengths on coordinates. But they represent the same point. Both represent the same point in the moduli space. But you have different coordinates, because it's only local coordinates. However, uh, what Weil uh, proved, Weil Peterson proved, is that uh, the, <coughs> the, the two form, sum from i equals 3g minus 3 
plus n dli ou hd theta i. It's called the Weil Peterson form. And this form is well defined over the moduli space and, the, and is independent of the choice of coordinates. Uh, is independent of the way you cut. Uh, is uh, the Weil Peterson form. Form. It's a two form. So let's call it omega. It's a two form. Uh, well, it is also sometimes denoted as two pi square kappa one. Okay. I'm not going to say what is kappa one for the moment. It's called the Mumford class. So you actually <coughs> compactify it, otherwise, no. uh, Worse. the kappa one comes. Yeah. You you can, you no, you can restrict to open part. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's just a notation for the moment. So, but so uh, this one form, uh, the, sorry, this two form allows to compute a volume. So this is a very old problem, and uh, where is the eraser? Okay. So here the Li's are real numbers, positive real numbers. Remember the Li's here, Li belong to R plus. They are positive real numbers. Okay. And what we would like to compute now is the volume Vgn of L1 Ln. We would like to compute the integral over Mgn of L1 Ln of this two form to the good power so such that it uh, becomes uh, a volume form. And the power is, uh, well, let me call that Dgn. And Dgn will be just a notation for that number which will come everywhere, 3g minus 3 plus n. OK? So if you put, so you see that this is the dgn is the dimension, sorry, 2 times dgn is the dimension of the moduli space. It's the number of coordinates. And so if you raise this two form at this power, it's a maximal, uh, it's a maximal dimension form. And divide by 1 over dgn factorial. So that's the volumes you would like to compute. And it's not so easy to compute them. Well, some of them are quite easy. So as I said, m03, remark that m03 of L1, L2, L3, I said there is a unique pair of points, so it's a point. There is a unique element in that space. Okay. So by definition, you will say that the volume Vgn of L1, L2, L3 is 1. OK. More difficult, people have computed, uh, people have computed V11 of L1. And the answer <coughs> is 1 over 24. 2 pi square plus 1 half of L1 square. What's that space? Sorry. What is that? Sorry? What is the surface? Can you so it's, uh, it's something with one, uh, one boundary on genus 1. So it's something like that. So one possibility, for instance, is to cut, to cut here. OK. <coughs> And the volume is that. OK, it's what it is. Another example, V04 of L1, L2, L4 is, uh, sorry, is, uh, is 2 pi square 
plus one half of L1 square plus L2 square plus L3 square plus L4 square. You see that it is always a polynomial of the Li squares. Uh, it's not obvious at all from the definition, but it's always a polynomial of the Li squares. That's what you get after computing. Uh, this has been computed by a method of hyperbolic geometry. It's quite complicated. Uh, and the idea is, is there an easier way to find the same quantities? Well, first, in fact, instead of... So, in 2004, Maria Mirzarani discovered a recursion relation to compute all those volumes by recursion on 2G minus 2 plus M. And that's why she got the Fields Medal, basically. Uh, and it was uh, and it really allows to compute in a rather easy way all those volumes by recursion. Is it that you found the way you can Excuse me? Is the formula depend on the way we formula can Formula, no. Okay. You can see that. In fact, Mirzarani's method is somehow to make the sum over all possible ways to cut and somehow divide. <laughs> okay, it uses what's called the McShain formula. I don't want to enter the details, but her proof is a long proof, uh, and, uh, and somehow the way it works is you have to take into account all the possible ways to cut. <coughs> okay, and somehow avoid double countings. Um, so, I'm not going to write Mirzarani's recursion for the volumes M, uh, V, G, N. I'm going to first Laplace transform. So V, G, N. Uh, depends on the way we cut. No, 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 no. This is the definition. So the definition is you compute the volume uh, with the Weil-Peterson form. The Weil-Peterson form uh, in a local patch of coordinate can be written. It depends, the way you write it depends on the way you cut, but the form is in fact independent of how you cut. So the volume form is independent, the volume is independent. So this space has a certain volume, and you want to compute it. And it's hard. And the reason why it's hard, it's precisely because the local coordinates do depend on the way you cut. But it's only local. <coughs> so let me first Laplace transform and define WGN of Z1, Zn is just integral from 0 to infinity of L1, dL1, e to the minus Z1, L1. Ln dLn e to the minus Zn Ln times this volume Vgn of L1 Ln. So you just uh, Laplace transform. Okay, oh sorry, it was here V03, of course. So if you do this Laplace transform, it's easy to see that W03 of Z1 z2, z3 is just 1 over z1 square, z2 square, z3 square. You just compute the Laplace transform of 1, basically. w11 of z1 is... <coughs> uh, let me write it this way. 1 over 24 times 3 over z1 to the power 4 plus 2 pi square over uh, z1 square this is to the power 4 another example is w04 of z1 z4 equals 1 over z1 square, z2 square, z3 square, z4 square times uh, times 2 pi square plus 3 times uh, sum from 1 to 4 of 1 over zi square. So if the volumes are polynomials in the Li squares, it's quite easy to see that the Laplace transforms are, are polynomials of the 1 over the i squares. It's kind of obvious. And so, <coughs> if you write Mirzarani's recursion for the volumes, 
and Laplace transform it, you will get a recursion for the WGNs. And that's what we did with my student Orantin in 2006. Uh, so we just Laplace transformed near the Ranis. So, uh, so Mirzarani, so this is the theorem by Mirzarani in 2004 plus Laplace transform that we did with Orantin in 2006. So this is just Laplace transforming Mirzarani's recursion. And in the WGN, what do you get? You get that WGN of Z1, Zn. So this is for n larger than 1, equals residue when z goes to 0 of, let me write it this way, z1 square minus z square, uh, 2 pi over sine 2 pi z times uh, w g minus 1 and plus 1 of z minus z z2 zn plus sum g1 plus g2 equals g and, uh, and let me write it this way i1 <coughs> so this means you should take the set Z2 to Zn. Uh, you should split it into two complementary subsets in all possible ways. Okay, and WG1, 1 plus cardinal of I1, Z I1, WG2, 1 plus cardinal of I2, minus z i2 and that's it and let me put what i will call uh, sum prime here and sum prime means that you exclude from the sum exclude uh, the case where g1 i1 is zero and empty ensemble and Uh, the case where G2 I2 is zero and empty ensemble. So you exclude those terms from the sum. <coughs> Let me show you that it's so I cheated a little bit. A residue is in fact as an integral. A residue is an integral. It does not mean just picking a coefficient in a series expansion. Uh, very often, people don't write the, the integration variable in residues because somehow, very often, this is assumed. I mean, you, you have no, there is no ambiguity on, on what is the, the integration variable, and you very often people don't write it. But it should be written. You can only compute residues of forms, not residues of functions. Uh, and the residue is an integral. And this is particularly useful to write it when you are going to make changes of variables. Otherwise, you forget the Jacobian and it changes the residue. <coughs> so, uh, and provided that we define So which is not a volume, so sorry, all those volumes were defined only, uh, so hyperbolic volumes. Are defined only for 2G minus 2 plus N, strictly positive. 
So for instance, 0, 1 or 0, 2 are not defined. There is no M01 of hyperbolic surfaces. There is no M02 of hyperbolic surfaces. There is no, uh, so which means that Gn must be different from 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and 1, 0. These are the four cases that are not, where hyperbolic volumes are not defined. And they are called the un unstable. Well, so if you have a surface with, uh, with a constant curvature minus one, uh, the Euler characteristic is, uh, sorry, uh, two pi times the Euler characteristic is the area of the surface, uh, sorry, is the, is the integral of the curvature, so it must be negative. So, the, uh, so for a hyperbolic surface, the curvature, uh, sorry, the Euler characteristic must be negative, strictly negative. Yeah, yes, yes. The, the whole modulus space is not defined. So MGN is not defined. So for this, MGN not defined. Does not exist. Would you care, please tell me, I didn't understand this residue part, you said integral. So I'm going to give, uh, to give uh, I'm going to do the example uh, of computation so, uh, sorry, I, I didn't say, provided that we define W02 of Z1, Z2. So we define it, it's not a volume, but we just define it as 1 over Z1 minus Z2 to the square. Let's define it that way. So let me, let me do the computation. So let me, uh, example of computation, W11. So let us apply the formula. So z is a new variable. No, not yet. Not yet. For the moment, these are just functions. Later, I will define forms. I will multiply by dz1, dz2, and so on to make them forms, differential forms. But for the moment, it's just functions. So dz times z1 square minus z square times 2 pi over sine 2 pi z times, and what do we have in this bracket? In this bracket, we have, well, here, g equals 1, n equals 1. That means you want to put a w0, 2 of z on minus z. Plus, and a priori, there could be this big sum. On this big sum, you would like to have g1 plus g2 equals 1. And i1 equals, uh, well, equals the empty set. That's what you would like to have in that case, uh, in that sum. And you see that either g1 equals 1 and g2 equals 0, or g1 equals 0 and g2 equals 1. So which means that all the terms that could arise in that sum are excluded terms. So in fact, there is no extra terms. So this is just what you have. <coughs> Excuse me? No, 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 no. I started with z2. So Z1 is here, and here that big term contains only Z2 up to Zn. Somehow it's related to that picture here. One remains on the left side, so one seems to play a different role from the others. And what is not obvious at all indeed is that what you will get in the end will be symmetric in all of them. Uh, it's not obvious at all from the picture or from this residue computation, it's not obvious at all that what you get is symmetric, but it will always be symmetric. <coughs> so let's compute that residue. Uh, sorry, and the residue is taken at z equals zero. So if you want to compute a residue, you have to compute the Taylor expansion near z equals zero. Well, first, 
this one, so let me write it this way, z1 square minus z square, 2 pi over sine 2 pi z, and this one is just 1 over z minus minus z, so it's 2z to the power 2, so it's 4z square. I have maybe made a mistake, sorry, it was just pi and not 2 pi. Okay, so let me put that 4 in front. Uh, so it's residue, so let me put that 1 over 4, residue when z goes to 0, dz. So here you have a z square coming from there. Okay, this one lets me write it as 1 over z1 square plus z square over z1 4 plus O of Z4. So that's just this 1 over Z1 square minus Z square. Ex Taylor expanded at Z equals 0. This pi over sine 2 pi Z is just 1 over 2Z uh, minus 1 over 6 2 uh, pi over 2 pi square Z square. Well, let me put the 1 over 2z in front, so 8z cube. Uh, so plus O of z4. Okay. So this is 1 over 8 residue when z goes to 0 dz over z cube times 1 over z1 square. Well, let me put the 1 over z1 square in front. 1 plus z square over z1 square plus O of z4 times 1 plus, so 4 pi square over 6 z square plus O of z4. Okay, and the residue picks the coefficient of 1 over z. So it's quite easy to see. It's 1 over 8 z1 square times 1 over z1 square plus uh, 2 pi square over 3. <coughs> okay. So this is the end of the computation. So you see, very easy. You can put it on uh, on a computer, and it uh, it computes automatically every WGN you want in a finite number of steps. It's quite easy. The first few are doable by hand in just like four lines, okay? And indeed, it gives the correct result. So you can check that this is equal to that. <coughs> yeah, it's not very important, but I think you can rescale everything by pi. And yeah. then you don't have pi in the form. Well, the Weil Peterson volume form is defined this way. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, you could, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course, there is a lot of homogeneity properties in everything, but uh, that's how things are usually normalized. So this is what you find, and this is the correct result, and I encourage you to compute double zero zero four by the same method, and you will find the correct result too, and anything you want, you will find the correct result by this method, and you see it's very easy to use in practice. <coughs> so this Mirzarani recursion somehow solved the problem, it uh, allows to compute all the volumes by a very simple recursion, And if you, so in fact, Mirzarani's recursion was written in the, in the real length, and it's an integral, uh, but written in Laplace transforms, it becomes a residue. 
and it's in fact easier to compute. Yeah. Ah, so in the general scheme, it's uh, uh, omega. It's not volume of something depending on the it's some Laplace transforms of volume. Yes, somehow. But it's again another kind of uh, of of surfaces with some decoration. Uh. You have a motivation for this formula that you pulled out of a hat for W zero two. Yes or no? <laughs> uh, I would have said zero. If it's not defined, then the volume has. Yeah. It's a uh, logical way to define it as zero. Yeah, good, good question. No, somehow this is what works. <laughs> yeah. No, and also just to tell you for the sign 2 pi z, initially, so. Uh, initially, well, so when, when Mirzarni's recursion was found in 2004. I had just found an, a recursion for computing the large n expansion in matrix in random matrices, and the two recursions were a little bit similar. And Orantin told me, "Look how similar they look. There must be a way to match to match them. And what uh, function should we use? And initially, we didn't know we should choose the sine function, sine to pi z. And we made a lot of tries, and somehow we 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 say, okay, let's take an arbitrary function like sum of t k." sum of t k z k instead of sine to pi z, and we computed the first two t k's such that they match. So we found uh, one over six times two pi to the cube. Uh, the next one was uh, uh, one over uh, five factorial times two pi to the five, and so on. And we went up to order fifteen before we decided well we should try the sine function, <laughs> and then it was very easy to prove afterwards. It's just Laplace transform. <coughs> <coughs> but so it's not obvious at all. You have to make some guesses. And it corresponds to the first, to what I said in the introduction. Given an enumerative geometry problem, you have to guess a complex curve that will give the, who's for which the computation of topological recursion uh, will give the same answer. You have to make a guess. And it's not obvious at all what should be that guess. There is no uh, general recipe. What's the complex curve here? Well, somehow this is this function, sine to pi z. And I'm going to say it in, in uh, so, and it's not algebraic, of course, in this example. So now let me go to the, so let me see how to define a generalization of that formula. So what can we generalize in that formula such that it can be applied to other cases? So. Let me start again. So, no, is it okay? No. No. Not yet. I'm just going to uh, <coughs> not yet. I'm just going to say, okay, this is Mirzarani's recursion, and uh, you see that there are some ingredients that are very specific to computing the hyperbolic volumes, and uh, and for instance. What else could we compute? So how can we generalize this formula so that it computes some other things than uh, hyperbolic volumes, not only hyperbolic volumes? As I said, initially, the way we, uh, the way we found that with Orantin is because we had a very similar recursion relation uh, in uh, random matrices. But in random matrices, this sign function was something else. It was not the sign function. It was something else. Uh, there are other few things that were different. Also, this denominator was a little bit different. Uh, but the same structure, the, this bracket here, was exactly the same. Uh, well, not exactly here. In fact, this function was not minus z, but something else. Uh, and uh, the residues were not taken at zero, but at other points. So somehow, what we tried to do was to find a common way to write the formula uh, a formula that would con contain the Mirzarni's case and the matrix model case and other cases too. Uh, for instance, one which was found for Havitz numbers. And, um, and is there a way to write uh, a general formula that could match for several examples? <coughs> and let me uh, replace things. So the first step will be to. Uh, in fact, what we had realized that, uh, in fact, when you do changes of variables, the WGNs do not really transform as uh, functions 
of z1, z2, zn, they transform as differential forms. So, in fact, it's useful to define some differential forms. So, define differential forms. So, uh, omega gn of z1, zn will just be wgn of z1, zn times dz1, dz2, dzn. In fact, this is a tensor product, but very often I will forget to write the cross. Okay? It's a symmetric end form, so this is a symmetric end form on a surface which will be, so here the zi's are just complex numbers. So it will just be on, so, and that I will call sigma. So on sigma to the n. So it's a tensor product, meaning that it's a one form in the first variable, whose, uh, it's a com linear combination of one forms in the first variables, whose coefficients are one forms in the second variables, uh, and so on. So it's just a tensor product. It's not the exterior product. <coughs> and it's symmetric. So, uh, so first we turn uh, the WGNs to differential forms. So what? So let's take this uh, equation and multiply by dz1, dzn on both sides. So here, for instance, we shall multiply here by dz2, dzn. And dz1, let me put it here, because z1 appears only there. Okay? So on the left side, by multiplying by this, we have turned that into a, the omega gn. <coughs> on the right side here, this is not yet exactly the omega g minus 1 and plus 1. Uh, because we have the dz and the minus dz that are missing. <coughs> so let's multiply by dz and by, by minus dz and divide by dz and minus dz. Okay. So now if we, so the, the denominator 1 of dz and minus dz, so minus 1 over dz to the square, Let me put it in front. And now you see that this is indeed the omega. And same thing here, it turns everyone into omegas. Okay. It may seem strange to have a dz in the denominator. Well, first observe that here we had a dz in the numerator that cancels one of them. So, but remember now that this contains a dz and a minus dz, so it's a quadratic form. Divided by dz, this is a one form. So, it makes sense. This is a one form. It's, uh, you can compute the residue of a one form. So, it may look strange to have the dz in the denominator, but remember that you have two dz in the numerator. <coughs> okay. So, this was the first step, turn everyone, so and now of course omega 0, 2 becomes dz1, dz2. Now observe the following property, which is integrate from minus z to z, integrate omega 0, 2 of z1. And the variable that you will integrate, let's give it a name, z prime equals minus z to z, z prime. So it's integral from minus z to z of dz1 dz prime over z1 minus z prime to the square. Okay, so the dz1, let's put it in front, it's spectator. Uh, okay, 
you can put it here. And, well, this is just one over z1 minus z minus one over z1 plus z. Okay? And this is just, so dz1 over z1 square minus z square times uh, 2z. So let me write it this way, dz1 to z. So it's this integral minus z to z of omega 0 2 of z1. And let me put a dot for the variable which is integrated. I'm not going to write it. <coughs> so which means, let me replace that quantity by this one. So here I will write from minus z to z of omega 0 2 of z1 divided by uh, divided by 2z. Okay. In fact, this dz, let me put it here. Let me put minus in front. Okay, so it's just a rewriting for the moment. It's just a rewriting. Now let me introduce another quantity. Let me introduce two functions. Introduce two functions. X of z, what will just be z square, and y of z, that will be uh, minus sine 2 pi z over 4 pi. Okay. Why not? <coughs> Observe that dx equals 2z dz. Okay, first thing, it's the same quantity that appears here. And second thing is that it vanishes at z equals zero. Let me call this point A. Okay. So, and another property is that x of minus z equals x of z. So the function uh, sigma of z equals minus z. So sigma is the function uh, that maps z to minus z. It's an involution. It's an, and it's an involution such that x of sigma of z equals x of z. Okay? So let me now replace everywhere where I had this minus z, let me replace it by sigma of z. Sigma of z and sigma of z. So the x on the spectral curve or on the c means this on the spectral curve in the neighborhood. So the spectral curve from the moment I've not really fully defined what is a spectral curve, but basically it's the space where z lives, uh, z. So this variable z it lives for the moment in the complex plane. And the spectral curve somehow it's the complex plane plus some extra structures which are those functions, those three functions. Uh, are defined on the complex plane and somehow the spectral curve will be the data of all that complex plane plus a function x and a function y and, uh, two on the form omega zero two. So this will be what I will call a spectral curve. It will be the data of all those things later. <coughs> so, uh, and so when I take 
So here I said that I will write that as dx of z. Okay. The residue I take it at the point where dx vanishes, so which is a, so where such that dx of a equals zero. Okay, and uh, so let me put the minus here. Let me observe that this denominator is nothing but uh, one over four y of z. Okay, this four, let me write it this way, two times one half here. Sigma also vanishes at zero, yes. at a. In fact, sigma of a equals a. Sigma of a is the fixed point of sigma. Sigma of a equals a, which is zero in that case. So sigma is indeed the involution that permutes the different branches uh, that correspond to the same x. So what will happen is that the map, so you have the complex plane, sigma uh, will be C, it's the complex plane, okay? And you map it by the function x also to the complex plane. So, but somehow this is a curve and this is a base curve and x is a projection from one to the other. And uh, the points where dx vanish vanishes are the branch points and, uh, and also sigma is a local involution uh, that permutes the different uh, sheets. So yes, sigma permutes the, branch, the different branches of the covering. So yeah, that will be the general. <coughs> Here in that case, there is only one. So this for this function x, there is only one fixed point. But indeed, uh, we, we decided to introduce those, uh, those generalization because for matrix models, typically you have two fixed points or, or more, or more than two fixed points. Mm -hmm. uh, but in matrix models, usually there were more than one fixed points. And that's so why we, we so yes. So then we shall sum over all, sum over all, all A such that dx of A equals zero. So you get the Euler characteristic. Sorry? So you get the Euler characteristic over no. there. No, not yet. No, 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 no. You don't have this no. type of theorem. Means yeah. Summing over so fixed points. No, it's, yeah. it's not compact um, curve. Yeah. Okay, it's not compact. Yeah. Yeah. So, and just let me say that here you have, I wrote 2 y times y of z, but let me be more subtle and write it this way. y of minus z, which is sigma of z. Okay. Let me do it this way. So, in that case, y is an odd function. So it does not change anything. But there are many examples that we shall consider where y is not an odd function and making this difference is crucial. <coughs> <coughs> so let me now say the following. So now choose so, uh, so it will be the definition of my. Um, so, so it will. So, for the moment, what I've done is just no. Sorry, let me. Excuse me. There is one more step. Let me. There is one more sp step. Is define omega zero one of z equals y of z dx of z. So it's a one form. So basically, omega 0, 1 is the form y dx. OK? Let me define this. So let me put this y together with this dx. Observe that dx of sigma of z equals dx of z. Observe that you have that. And so, so now replace this. So put the dx together and here define omega zero one of z minus omega zero one of sigma of z. Okay, so you see that now in this way, 
all the ingredients you need So it's just a rewriting of Mirzarani's recursion, but in a way that we could hope to uh, apply to other choices of x, y, and so on. Okay, so now let me uh, le let us make a, a true definition corresponding to that. So what are the ingredients we need? We need to have a omega zero two. Uh, we need to have a function x that realizes is a covering of. Uh, of let's say uh, a surface, a Riemann surface by another Riemann surface. You need to have a covering uh, for which you have uh, that has branch points, and for which locally there is an involution that permutes the branches that cross at the branch point. Okay, so we need that. We need a one form omega zero one. We need an omega zero two, and you see it was quite um, important that it had a double pole. So it needs to have a double pole. Uh, it needs also to be symmetric. And, uh, and apart from that, that's more or less all what we need. Another remark is that since we are going to compute residues, all what we need to be able to do is to compute Taylor expansions near the branch points. Basically, everything which is far away from the branch points does not matter at all. So in fact, and also residues will pick a finite number of terms in the Taylor expansion. So in fact, if you have a true convergent, uh, so if you have um, a true analytic function uh, whose radius of convergence is uh, larger than zero, or if you just have a formal series, does not make any difference in computing the residue. The residue only picks a finite number of terms. So if the radius of convergence is zero, that does not matter. You can still compute this. <coughs> so in fact, what we shall generalize, y will not need to be a function of z, a meromorphic function of z. It will just need to be a formal series of z, a germ of analytic function. But, uh, you don't really need x and y. And they're not a no, in fact, you need x on w01. And indeed, you don't really need x. You just need the involution. Uh, you just need to know that there are branch points on involutions. In fact, that's all what you need. But for my, uh, I prefer to introduce really a function x. There has been a lot of debates about that. Do you really need a function x or just locally? Uh, in fact, what you really truly no locally need is a kind of polarization procedure. Uh, but OK. <coughs> so somehow, a function x is a little bit too much. Sorry? Uh, because uh, when I will consider the deformation theory of all that, I like to consider the deformation of the moduli of the function x. But okay, I mean this is not fully uh, fully established uh, thing. May basically, there are still probably uh, improvements that can be made. But so let me define what I will call a spectral curve. So two one. So so this will be my part two. Two definitions. And so 2, 1 will be uh, spectral curves. So a defini my definition will be that a spectral curve, S equals spectral curve, will be the data of a Riemann surface. So omega 0, 1 and omega 0, 2. So a spectral curve will be the data of uh, of four things, okay? Sigma is a uh, Riemann surface. What, in fact, people like to call local Riemann surface means that it does not need to be uh, not necessarily connected, compact, or connected 
typically all what you want is that it contains some vicinities of a branch point. So all what is needed is that it contains uh, some vicinity of branch points. So it can be just a union of small disks. It can just be a union of small disks that contains the branch points. And whether there is a general, uh, whether all those disks can be put together to into a curve does not matter at all. Sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. And if they can, that means basically that the mirror uh, in your enumerative geometry problem is really a curve. If they can't, it means it's not a curve, but typically a higher dimensional space. Well, OK, let me not insist on that. But what you need to run the definition of topological, to run the, to run the recursion, all what you need is that it contains some small vicinities of the branch points. That's all what is needed. OK. So, second thing is that X is a map from sigma to, uh, let's say, CP1. And such that uh, DX has a finite number of simple zero. In fact, uh, you can uh, generalize this notion of finite numbers uh, if you have a way to take sums. So for instance, if you have some gradings or, uh, for instance, introducing a Q, uh, a Q parameter. On, so if you have a way to, to, to define sums of infinite numbers, then uh, it's possible to get rid of that assumption. And the fact that they have simple zeros, it's only for the moment. I will later give a definition when the zeros are not simple. So let me, for, for the moment, say that this is a regular, regular spectral curve. So a regular spectral curve means that the zeros are simple. And uh, so if A, a is, uh, is a zero of dx. <coughs> uh, there exists a local, sorry, and it's, it must be holomorphic. Or m let's say meromorphic. Uh, there exists a local involution, sigma a, in a vicinity, in a neighborhood of a, such that x of sigma a of z equals x of z. So in fact, what you need is the involution rather than the function x. I agree. And it can be defined only using the differential form dx, in fact. So z belongs to c, sigma. Sorry? Z, z belongs to sigma. Yes, z belongs to sigma in a, in a neighborhood of A. Z belongs to a neighborhood of A. In a neighborhood of A. on such that sigma a of a equals a. And sigma a is, of course, different from the identity. Mm. You choose the other, of course. Sigma is <coughs> also formal. Excuse me? Sigma is also holomorphic. Formal? Um, holomorphic. Sorry, holomorphic? Holomorphic. Yes. Yeah, yes, it's holomorphic. Uh, if x is holomorphic uh, locally, then sigma is holomorphic. It's not unique, so it should be part of the time. No, it's unique. Uh, it's unique if, X has, uh, if dx has simple zeros. Yes. If dx has simple zeros, it's unique. Otherwise, indeed, it's not unique. And omega zero 1 uh, is a 
meromorphic one form. No, sorry, it's a germ, a formal germ of meromorphic in the neighborhoods of A's, of branch points. <coughs> so typically, locally, so locally a good uh, local variable near A is, uh, is zeta A uh, of z, uh, which, will, which is just x of z minus x of a. Okay, this is a local variable. And the involution is just zeta goes to minus zeta, changing the sign of the square root. But this is defined only locally, it cannot be defined globally in general. So, uh, so typically, omega 0, 1 will be a sum, uh, sum of t a k, zeta to the 2k plus 1, uh, so 2 zeta d zeta, so, uh, so times dx and dx, uh, 2 zeta d zeta. Uh, let me so from k equals, in principle, from 0 to infinity, that's, but let me, in fact, choose the coefficient from 1 to infinity. Uh, and let me call the first coefficient 1, of t, 1 over t a 0. And this is only the odd part plus even part. Okay. But since I'm going to take the difference, you see, I'm going to take a difference omega 0, 1 of z minus omega 0, 1 of sigma of z. So it means that only the odd part matters. And in fact, it's customary to normalize things slightly differently and put a 2 to the power k over 2k plus 1 double factorial. to define those coefficients t a k's. So that defines the coefficient t a k's. <coughs> and t a zero is here. They are the coefficients of... T zero is kind of inverse to t zero. Right? Notation is not... <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. But it's because if you, you do that, uh, you will get only polynomials in the t's. Uh, nothing in the denominator. If you put the t a zero in the numerator, you will have uh, it will appear in the denominator in the end. Okay. So these are, these are just the Taylor series coefficients, and see it's a formal series. It does not need to have a radius of convergence. So why CP one? Uh, why not higher dimension? Could be. Could it could be another, or it could be another Riemann surface sigma zero doesn't matter at the moment. But since everything locally, so since in fact you just look at neighborhoods, a neighborhood of a Riemann surface is always a neighborhood of CP1. Maybe C. Or C. Yeah, could be, just a disk in fact. <coughs> and omega zero two is a meromorphic uh, one tensor one form on sigma cross sigma. This one, I like it to be defined in a full neighborhood, so not only a formal series. Uh, again, I'm not sure it's absolutely necessary, but let me assume that it's really now not just a formal series, but really uh <coughs> with a double pole on the diagonal. on the diagonal. So which means that omega 0, 2 should be F and it's, it must be symmetric 
it's crucial. Omega 0 to in any local coordinates should behave like uh, dz1. So for instance, uh, you could use the coordinates. So here, this notation means plus uh, analytic at when z1 goes to z2. So the leading coefficient is one. In fact, you can generalize that also. So this is the simplest case, but this can be generalized. Uh, let me write it here. In fact, when you have several branch points, so imagine you have, so sigma is a kind of cover. And here you have your sigma zero, and this is the cover by x. Okay, you have one branch point here, let's call it a1, another branch point here, let's call it a2. Okay, uh, the local involution sigma a1 is, is the involution that exchanges those two points. You see that over a given point here, x, you have several pre images, you have, let's say, here three branches and the local involution exchanges these two but does not touch that one. I mean, it's not defined near the other one. But here the local involution would exchange these two branches. <coughs> uh, okay, and uh, so if you have two neighborhoods, so if you take two neighborhoods, uh, So if you take two neighborhoods, what you need really is that omega zero two. So if you take omega zero two of z one z two, if you want to uh, study it uh, in neighborhoods, so when z one goes to is close to uh, to um, let's say to a branch point A on z two is close to a branch point B. It can be the same or it can be different. Okay? <coughs> well, and in the local variables, square root uh, of x minus x of A and square root of x minus x of B, basically you would like it to behave like delta AB uh, d zeta A of z1 d zeta B of z2 of zeta a of z1 minus zeta a of z2 zeta b of z2 to the square plus and again we shall compute the Taylor expansion plus sum over k and l let's call the coefficient b a k b l this way zeta a of z1 to the power uh, 2k zeta b of z2 to the power 2l d zeta a of z1 d zeta b of z2 okay sorry to the power k zeta b of z2 the power 2L. So these are just the Taylor the and leave some space here because I like to put a 2 to the 2K plus L plus 1 over 2K plus 1 double factorial, 2L plus 1 double factorial. It's just a normalization. So yes, plus plus even parts. Uh, you see this is odd because there is 2k times one, uh, 2k plus 1, so this is somehow, this is odd, or in fact, so in the coefficients you can add odd parts. But the coefficients, the Taylor expansion coefficient of the odd parts will play no role. So are you saying that leading part after involution get hyperparameterized and leading parts remain the same? Sorry. So 
the leading leading terms yes, in this, this yeah. Yes. Okay. so after after you introduce this in involution yeah. then it reparameterizes and yeah. then the remain, leading terms remain the same yeah 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 yes so because everything will be invariant by this involution so only the part of the taylor expansion which is invariant by the involution uh, matters the non uh, invariant parts will be cancelled uh, will will cancel out <coughs> Well, just a remark here, you could replace this delta AB, uh, can be replaced by, uh, let's, by, let me write it, one half of KAB. And in fact, it's uh, interesting to take a carton matrix here. This is a nice generalization. It's when you put a Carter matrix instead of delta AB. Yeah, but in this case, you, you have to identify local coordinates are different. Yeah, yes. So, and it's useful, for instance, for heating systems. So, in this case, you have two different local coordinates, and they are identified by this matrix. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So, but f I will stay with delta AB, but you could generalize by putting a Carter matrix. So, this is the definition of spectral curve. So now that we have defined a spectral curve, then we shall define the topological recursion. And the formula is written here, in fact. So it's uh, my part 2-2. Two, two. So two, 2 definition of TR. And so the definition define omega gn uh, by this formula. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I give you a sequence of t's and b's, uh, any sequence, would you call it a spectrum? Can I do the reverse? Would you call it a spectrum? Yeah. Yes, basically that's what I did here. Any sequence of t's defines um, an omega zero one. Well, regarding omega zero two, I like it to be a really uh, to have a finite radius of convergence. It's not. I think it's not necessary, but I like to have this property. Sorry, uh, k and l are positives. Yes. So any without any restrictions on this t k. You are oh. uniquely determining this omega. Yes. Uniquely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, the data of omega zero one is exactly the same as the data of the t case. Uh, it contains exactly the same information. Okay. <coughs> yeah, too, what did you say? Okay. It's, it's also arbitrary numbers b. So the again, so those b a case b l's are more or less arbitrary, but I like to have uh, that this series is convergent in a disk. Okay, I, I like this to re be an analytic function in a f disk uh, with finite radius of convergence, so which puts some restrictions on the bees that you can choose, but they are not very strong restrictions. And you included omega 0 2 in the definition of the spectrum. Yes, the yes. Of the deformation. yes. Yes, omega zero two is included in the definition of a spectral curve. So the spectral curve is the data of the four things, yeah, sigma x. Included, the deformation here is perfectly white. Sorry, no, no, no. Why, why did you include it? It's in the definition of the spectral curve. The deformation theory properties of, of the future or why? Okay, we'll we'll see that uh, in the next lecture, but. Uh, no, in fact, there are some deformations of uh, omega zero two and omega zero one that can be totally independent. Okay, some splitting of the Hodge filtration. Yes, 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 I agree. So either include or not. Okay, I agree, but for the moment, this is my definition. Okay, this is my definition. So uh, now, this is well defined. So you define omega gn by uh, so by a recursion on n on 
uh, 2g minus 2 plus n. It's a recursion on that number because you see that to express the left hand side, you need to have already computed some omega g prime n prime with uh, a smaller value of this number. So it's a recursion on it's a, it's a recursion, and in fact, it means that you can compute omega g n uh, in exactly 2g minus 2 plus n steps. <coughs> yes, yes. So in the first step, you determine omega 0, 3 and omega 1, 1. In the second step, you can compute omega 0, 4, and so on. So let me state some property. Oh, no, sorry. The definition is not yet. So that's for n larger than 1. And the definition, let me also define omega g 0. Uh, well, omega g0 contains, so basically n is always the number of variables here. Omega g0 contains nothing. Uh, omega g0 is what I will call fg of my spectral curve. is defined as 1 over 2g minus 2 times sum over all branch points, residue at the branch point of omega g1 of z times a function that I will call f01 of z, where d the differential of df01 is omega01. <coughs> and that's defined for g larger than 2. So it's a definition. There is a definition for f1 and f0, that uh, I'm not going to write. Uh, I'm not going to write them. And in fact, it's not only civil literature, there are some subtleties. Uh, in fact, f1 can be defined. You see that this formula does not make sense for f1 because there is 1 over 2g minus 2. Okay? Uh, but there is a way to define f1. Uh, it's just basically it involves not only residue, but there are logs and things like that. I don't want to enter the details. Uh, but for f0, there is a fundamental difficulty to define f0. And I will talk about that uh, in the next lectures. Uh, there are some important subtleties about F0. <coughs> <coughs> so, some properties. So, let me state a few uh, theorems about the properties. So, first of all, there are many, many examples where you have a spectral curve and you run this and it computes some things that are useful, for instance, in random matrices. In random matrices, if you take, uh, is as spectral curve, you take, um, you take the, the large n uh, limit of the spectrum of a random matrix, uh, then basically you compute all the large size expansion, large n expansions of correlation functions. So, miraculously, with this procedure. <coughs> so, let me just say a few properties. The large uh, lar correlation function of what? Is I'm, I'm, I'm not going to enter the details. I, I don't want to. We can discuss that later, but it's just to say that this formula does indeed compute interesting things in many, interest in many cases. And in Mirzarani's case, you see it computes the hyperbolic volumes. Uh, if you start with another, if you start with a curve, uh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm going to give examples. Uh, but so, just let me state some properties. So, technically, omega g n is a symmetric. So that's a theorem. Omega g n is a symmetric. That's not trivial from the definition 
and form on sigma 2 n. It's not obvious from the definition because Z1 seems to play a role totally different from Z2 up to Zn. It seems to play a totally different role, but it's always symmetric. It can be proved by recursion. Yeah, uh, in a form of sigma mi minus uh, ramification point. Yeah, I'm going to write it. So in fact, uh, the true, uh, so it's meromorphic. with poles only at ramification points. And of, the, of order, the order of the poles is at most uh, 2 times 3g minus 3 plus n plus 2. Sorry? No. No. Oh, except omega, sorry, for 2g minus 2 plus n positif. They have no poles on the diagonal. Only omega 0, 2 has a pole on the diagonal. And omega 0, 1 can have pole anywhere, okay? But all the stable ones have poles only at the ramification points. And so, technically, I will write that omega g n belongs to uh, H0 of sigma n to uh, K sigma of, uh, let me call it this way, uh, sim. So this notation means that this is the canonical bundle of sigma raised uh, to the, so uh, the tensor product of n copies, and each copy, so somehow each copy corresponding to one of the factors of uh, sigma to the n, that's what this square box means, R is the set of ramification points. <coughs> so which is the set of A such that dx of A equals zero. And star means that there can be any degree. Uh, in fact, the degree is bounded by that. So, and another part of the theorem, so the, the, tr the really true important statement in that theorem, well, no, there are several important statements, but one thing that is not trivial is that it is symmetric. Another thing which is not so trivial but quite easy to see in the definition is that the, the poles can be only at the ramification points and it's because we take residues at ramification points. That's the only places where you can generate poles. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, in fact, no, I should have said branch points because uh, they can be, the poles can be on any pre-image of the ramification points in case where you have this Carton matrix. Okay. Um, well, and so uh, the fact that the poles at, at, are at ramification points, there is also one important property is that the residues of omega gn are zero at any ramification point. Uh, if you take the residue in any of the variables, the residue is zero. So they are poles without residues. And this is why this definition here is well defined because you see F01 is one integral of omega 01. So it could be, it's defined up to an additive constant. But because the residue of omega G1 is zero, the additive constant plays no role. So this is well defined because of that property. So it does not depend on the choice of primitive you take for F01. So uh, let me state two more. So. So let me state another theorem which is nice, which is that now if you take 
uh, omega gn of z1 zn equals 1 over 2g minus 2 plus n sum over a of residue at z goes to a omega g n plus 1 of z1 zn z and f0 1 of z. So for every In fact, for n equals 0, this was the definition. But for n larger than 1, this is a theorem. In fact, this is the theorem which motivated the definition. It is often called, uh, for its, the way it appears in string, when you look at applications to string theories, it's often called the dilaton equation. In the spirit of moduli spaces of surfaces, it means that if you have something, some surfaces of genus G with n plus 1 boundaries, and you glue a disk to one of the boundaries, you get surfaces with n boundaries. Somehow, it's the way to close a boundary, to glue a disk on a boundary. <coughs> so another uh, property that is useful is uh, I define the rescaling of spectral curves. Uh, it's an homogeneity property. Uh, definition, uh, if you take lambda belongs to C star, uh, you shall define lambda times the spectral curve. So, uh, so if so if you take S, a spectral curve, sigma x omega 0, 1 and omega 0, 2, you shall define lambda times your spectral curve as just rescaling omega 0, 1, lambda omega 0, 1, omega 0, 2. So it's just rescaling omega 0, 1. Then the theorem is that omega g n computed for a spectral curve is lambda to the 2 minus 2 g minus n omega g n. So basically, the omega gn's are homogeneous of degree 2 minus 2g minus n. And this is obvious from the definition because omega 0, 1 appears only there. And basically, uh, it's the number of times you apply the recursion, and which is 2g minus 2 plus n. <coughs> okay, so uh, let me just finish by showing a few examples of uh, a few examples of um, of spectral curves. Let me just give you a few small examples of spectral curves. So. Examples. So an interesting example is the following. Take S, so S equals CP1, uh, X of Z equals the map Z cube minus 3Z, Y of Z equals Z4 minus 4z minus 4z square plus 2. Notice that these are the Chebyshev polynomials of degree 3 and 4. And, sorry? Yes, so in fact, omega 0, 1 is y dx. Okay.
So this one is, is especially useful. You see x is of degree 3, is a degree 3 covering. Uh, so there are three branches, and there are, in fact, two branch points. So if you write dx, dx, it's uh, 3 times z squared minus 1 dz. So there are two uh, branch points, a equals plus and minus 1. There are the, are the two branch points. Yeah, OK, C. <coughs> <coughs> they satisfy the equation uh, y cube minus 3y minus uh, x4 plus 4x square minus 2 equals 0. So they satisfy a polynomial equation, p of xy. Okay, the two satisfy a polynomial equation. <coughs> so there are two branch points, and if you want to compute the sigma a of z, it can be written explicitly minus z plus a times square root of 12 minus 3z square. So you see you have two involutions. So basically you have sigma plus and sigma minus uh, that correspond to choosing different branches of a square root. And uh, this one is very useful to compute uh, well to compute things about the Ising model. It's related to the Ising model. But I will not say how. So if you compute all the omega GNs of that, it's very closely related to an Ising model. I'm not going to say how, but uh, it's a very useful, very interesting case. Another interesting case is consider the equation y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3. So a typical elliptic curve. Typical elliptic curve. So it can be parameterized as follows. So s will be the torus uh, of modu some modulus tau, which is related to g2 and g3. And the function x of z will be the Weierstrass function p of z. And the function y of z will be p prime of z. And they satisfy this equation. Omega 0, 1 is, as usual, y dx. And for omega 0, 2 of z1, z2, you want something that has a double pole on the diagonal. So let's take the Weierstrass function of z1 minus z2. It has a double pole. Uh, you can add any constant to it dz1, dz2. This curve is very useful and is related to cyborg witten SU, I think, SU2. You're calling it a cyborg witten curve? Excuse me? Is it a cyborg witten curve? Yes, more or less. Yes, it's, a, it's more or less the cyborg witten curve. Yeah. So there are plenty of other examples. Another example which I like is uh, the, f the case where S is C minus R minus X of Z is uh, minus Z plus log Z, Y of Z equals Z, and omega 0, 2 uh, is the one I usually choose for the complex plane, DZ1, DZ2 over z1 minus z2 to the square. OK? <coughs> you can check that e to the x equals y e to the minus y, which means that y is the Lambert function of e to the x. It's often called the Lambert curve. And this is the definition of a Lambert function. This is the very definition of a Lambert function. And if you look at, if you plot x, y, it will look like that. OK. There is one branch point. Your second example does compute wrong fit invariance for result point? No. What's computes? In fact, 
this topological string partition function. In fact, if you really want to, to see that it computes, uh, yes, it's related to some, uh, no, in fact, to re-get the topological string partition function, you need to take x equals log of that and y equals log of that. But uh, so basically, it's when you go to the exponential variables that you recompute topological strings. Uh, but this is uh, this one does compute a matrix model, a certain matrix model. Is it a cross partition function for for this uh, with this zebra geometry? Uh, it's related to a cross of partition function. Yeah, I'm not sure which one this one is. Oh, this one? No. This uh, this. Uh, Yes, it's related to an across of partition function. It's uh, it's very closely related. Well, no, not exactly that one, but something that looks like that. I, I, indeed, well, so the idea is that for every topological strings on a toric Calabi house, for instance, there is a spectral curve, and it's basically the mirror. And that's what I wanted to point out. So, for instance, imagine that you take, uh, imagine indeed, the, for instance, the result conifold. And imagine that you take the equation, uh, so e to the minus x, uh, sorry, e to the x plus e to the y plus e to the minus x minus y plus q equals zero. Okay. Take this equation and you see that it's the curve that is the mirror of the resolved conifold. Uh, in fact, the, the sigma is a torus. Sigma is a torus, and, uh, and this defines two functions, x and y, on the torus. This defines uh, one form y dx. Uh, basic, but basically, w the fact is that e to the x and e to the y are meromorphic functions. So x is the log of a meromorphic function, and y is uh, the log of a meromorphic function. So which means that the form y dx has logarithmic singularities. But that doesn't matter because the logarithmic singularities are not at the branch points, so you can still compute everything. And then this computes the omega GNs are the Gromov of written invariants for the resolved conifold. This has been proved. If you take any curve, then what you compute is the V model partition function of Colabi, you yes. know, UV plus the curve. Yes, somehow, yeah or some generalization of that. But that's the idea, yes. The idea is that you are always computing uh, the B-model uh, side of Gromov written invariants. So, le so let's stop here for today. So, uh, excuse me? Oh, lo sorry, Lambert curve computes the Hurwitz numbers. Uh, I can even write the full definition for Lambert curve. Uh, so yes, indeed, that's an interesting example for for the for the Lambert curve. <coughs> I can write what the Lambert curve omega G ends are. So for Lambert curve. So omega gn of z1 zn is uh, sum of, let's call that hgn of uh, of mu, sum of our mu is such that of length n uh, over 2g minus 2 plus n plus mu factorial m mu of e to the x1 where uh, x where xi equals x of zi. So with this function x minus zi plus log of zi. Okay, and mu, mu are partitions. Uh, 
and so on, of length at, mo at most n. So which means that some of the mu i's can, uh, can be zero. Okay, and hg mu, hgn of mu one, mu n is the number of ways uh, of factorizing a permutation sigma whose class of class So C mu is the set of um, conjugacy classes of permutations. Sorry. Um, the conjugation class of a permutation is just the length of these cycles. So a permutation sigma uh, with cycles of length uh, mu 1 to mu n, and you want to factorize it uh, as a product of 2g minus 2 plus n plus mu uh, transpositions. So, in, so if you take a given permutation with cycles of length mu 1 up to mu n, in how many ways can you factorize it into a product of transpositions uh, with that number of transpositions? It's a certain number. This Hg mu, this Hgn of mu is a certain uh, integer number, uh, and this is called the Hurwitz number. You should, maybe you should write maybe product of some. Product of transpositions. So uh, it's in principle it's time to stop, but. Le let me just give you an example, H01 of mu1 of mu. Uh, so it's the way number of ways of factorizing a permutation with a simple cycle. So take the, the permutation, so take the permutation 1, 2, n. So that's the cycle, uh, so that's the cycle 1, 2, 3, and so on. N. So this is that permutation. Okay. In how many ways? So sigma equals that. In how many ways can you write it as the product of mu minus one uh, equals product of tau one, tau two, tau. Uh, sorry, it's not n. It's called. Uh, let me call that number k. And where? Sorry. Well, let me, this is the number of mu, tau mu minus one. Okay. So, so it looks at like relation fundamental group of punctured sphere, not to yes. the curve. So so it, no, it looks like a relation of fundamental group of punctured sphere. Yeah. Yes, yes, it of, is. Yeah, but for g is bigger than one, we should add product of a i b commutator of a i b i the times. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. You can consider representation of uh, essentially consider homomorphism of fundamental group of yeah. punctured surface yes. to symmetric group. Yeah. But fundamental group of punctured surface is not free group with some six product is one. When genus is bigger than zero, it's more complicated. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's yeah. It's a small mistake. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but okay. In genus zero, you agree that it's bad. It's okay. Yeah, in genus zero, it's, you agree that it's bad. So, for instance, when mu equals two, for mu equals two, it's just the transposition one two, and there is a unique way to decompose it as a product of one transposition. Yeah, no, no, I just said that for genus big as one, should write in different ways, not uh, not a product. It's because you need relations fundamental group of a surface product. Of well, here it's defined as something of a symmetric group. I'm quite sure that this is the correct definition. I have a question on this notation. Uh, so you say that omega gn is the set H0, means cohomology group H0. So 
basically it's the section of a of homogeneous line bundle or whatever yeah. bundle over sigma n. Yeah. So this theorem you prove that this is uh, of degree some 2g minus 2 plus n, it should be followed from the theorem there that omega g n belongs to the sections of this. No, 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 no. 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 Why no. not? Because this is also a homogeneous no, section. No, no, no. It's mm -hmm. the, the, the procedure it, it, this depends on omega 0, 1 and the question mm -hmm. yeah. what's the homogeneity degree of dependence. It has nothing to do with this. So yeah. here, here you also, we also have a homogeneous of positive degree, this omega no, g n. No, 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 but it's... I think we are not talking about the same thing. No, we, we are not talking about the same thing, uh, not the same homogeneity. Uh, I, I was, so the homogeneity I was mentioning before was the homogeneity with respect to the one form omega zero one, and I think it's not the same you, you're talking about. But so, so if, okay, provided we have the good definition of Hurwitz numbers, uh, it is proved that the omega GNs defined by the topological recursion for that spectral curve do indeed compute the generic functions of Hurwitz numbers. So is the Hurwitz number of the spectral curve? You no, 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 no. Hurwitz number is number of coverings with different ramification. Yes. Oh, of the, oh, of of the CP, spectral curve. Of CP1. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, this is cons computing the... Oh, yes, the sorry, sorry, yeah, so, so you have... You have uh, so you have a certain number K which is the weight of a partition mu uh, sheets to cover. So you have coverings and you have a special point, let's say at infinity. Uh, at infinity, you have a point with a certain ramification profile. So here you have, let's say, three branches coming together and two branches coming together. So that would be given by that partition at infinity. OK? So it's simple of its numbers. And the way, since you want to factorize it as a product of transposition, it means in how many ways can you put other branch points, which are simple branch points. You want the everything to be connected. I Sorry, I forgot to say connected. I forgot to say uh, it's called uh, as a transitive product. Transitive means connected. Transitive action, there is a group action yeah. that is transitive. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it's the symmetric group action. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in how many ways such that the genus of that surface would be G? So, how many? So, it means it's the number of homotopy classes of uh, such uh, decompositions. Ah, ah, sorry, I mix, mix up with coverings of hygienous curves. It's all, yeah. all these coverings of CP1. Yes, so I think there is no problem here. So. In how many ways can you cover CP1 with uh, mu sheets uh, in such a way that you have something of genus G unconnected? So this is so the SGN, AGN of mu is just an integer number, and you want so this omega GN defined here. So here it's the monomial symmetric function, the monomial symmetric polynomial. This defines a series of Z1, Z2, Zn, and the theorem is that it's the same thing that you compute by the topological recursion applied to that curve. This is a theorem. This was first a conjecture by Bouchard and Marigno, and we proved it uh, with um, Moulassé and Safnuc uh, in 2008, I think. Uh, but then uh, we realized that it's, uh, it's just a subcase of um, something much more general. Basically, it works for all gromov witten invariants of toric Calabiao threefolds and orbifolds. And so the, the general theorem is that if you take a curve, <coughs> if you take a spectral curve that is the mirror of some toric Calabiao threefold, then the topological recursion applied to that curve computes the gromov witten invariants of, of, of the corresponding uh, toric Calabiao threefold. And that's a theorem. Uh, it's been also established for orbifolds. But it's not known if you can go beyond toric. Toric orbifolds. But it's not known if this is still true uh, if it's not toric, for instance, for Wuquintic. It's believed that it's true, that it continues to hold, but uh, there is no proof of that. And also, uh, another thing interesting that I will mention is that if you take as a curve the A polynomial of a knot, 
the conjecture is that somehow you are computing the coefficients in the expansion of the Jones polynomials or the Humphrey polynomials. So this is an extension of the volume conjecture, but this is a conjecture. The even the leading order is not proved. So, uh, so it's supposed to be hard, but we checked it to a few orders uh, for simple nodes like figure of eight nodes, and it works perfectly. And it's not a toric case. It's not toric nodes. I don't know if I'm um, okay. I know there are some works on that. I'm not specialist, but uh, but um, I, I'm not sure what it is. If B model color BR is not pi bar over curve, then yeah. we should not expect uh, yes. curve computation. You should expect yeah. computation spirit of B where we yeah, yeah, use three dimensional. I, I agree, but still it works. I, I no, I don't know for which Calabio, but if you take a spectral curve uh, A polynomial, it works. But but indeed, the A polynomial of a knot is not uh, the mirror curve of a toric Calabio, uh, as far as I know. But still, it works. But it's a conjecture. Um, much more general than the volume conjecture. So. That's the end for today. So what I want to show next time is that, so we have a recursive definition and a good way to write recursions is to write them graphically. This is basically the picture. And in fact, many of the theorems I mentioned, for instance, the fact that you get something which is symmetric can be proved graphically. And there is a nice combinatorial way to represent this recursion and uh, just using combinatorics and with which you find very uh, quickly the, so there is a new formalism introduced for this topological recursion by Maxim and uh, Jan Seubelman. And uh, an easy way to see it is using the graphical representation. And this graphical representation is very useful to compute things. And it's also what allows to write, uh, to find a moduli space on the cohomology class on that moduli space, such that the omega GNs computed by the topological recursion are indeed integrals of cohomology classes uh, in this MGN. And the formula is amazingly simple. And I will give you a, a proof of Mirzarani's recursion. Uh, in I, I call it a four-line proof of Mirzarani's recursion, but four lines is really because I expand all the details of the computation. And basically, it consists in proving that the Laplace transform of the sine function is, uh, is uh, basically a very simple function. So, uh, and also for the case of uh, Lambert curve, the computation is quite simple. Yeah, there is another formula saying that this is also, this is called the ELSV formula. This is also an integral over MGN bar of the Hodge class. Let me call it this way. Uh, times, uh, <coughs> uh, product from i equals 1 to n of 1 minus mu psi i, mu i psi i, uh, times some factors what, that are uh, e to the mu i x i dx i, and probably something like mu i to the mu i divided by mu i factorial, something like that. Does someone remember LSV formula by heart? It's something of that sort uh, on some of our mu. Okay. <coughs> and basically, I will show what this corresponds to for general spectral curves. The idea is that instead of the Hodge class, we'll have another class that depends on the spectral curve, and I will give you an explicit formula for that class that generalizes the, the Hodge class. And for the Lambert curve, I will show you by a very easy computation that indeed we recover the Hodge class. And for the and for Mirzarani case, instead of a Hodge class, you just need to take exponential kappa one. And for, uh, and for toric Calabio of three folds, it's a combination of product of three Hodge classes. 
Well, I, I can stop here. Mm.